and now as a politician. The auto gyro is away for the golf links. It's an easy step to the links by auto gyro. His upper class bearing earns him as many enemies as friends. He is a man of contrasts and enormous ambition. It is good for the government, it is good for the country, and it is good for all of us to enjoy a good glass of beer. But none of this would have been possible had it not been for the greatest adventure of his life, 20 years before. June 1911. Hiram Bingham packs for a journey to the jungles of Peru. His goal is to seek out the legendary lost city of the Incas. He was never trained as an archaeologist. He was on the Yale faculty. He was a professor of Latin American history and geography rather than archaeology. But it was a time when exploration uh, was uh, uh, very much in the in the news. It is an age when the very ends of the earth are within the reach of human footsteps. September 7th, 1909. Commander Robert E. Perry has discovered the North Pole. From all over the world comes full acknowledgement of Perry's feat and congratulations on his success. A time when the thrill of exploration fascinates everyone, from the pauper in the street to presidents like Teddy Roosevelt when a great discovery can make a man more famous than a movie star. Kipling wrote a poem that influenced my father, I'm sure, called The Explorer, uh, in which the phrase appears, something lost behind the ranges, uh, something calling to you, go, uh, words to that effect. So it seemed natural to achieve fame by becoming an explorer. June 8th, 1911. Bingham's quest for fame leads him on a journey to Peru. He brings a team from Yale and the latest books on the Incas. But why Peru? In 1909, the South American history teacher saw his first Incan ruin, Choquequirao. Some said it was the lost city, but Bingham has his doubts. The lost city is still out there, and a seed is sown in Bingham's soul. Bingham's family is no stranger to adventure. In the 1820s, his grandfather left New England to become Hawaii's first missionary. In my book, Portrait of an Explorer, I had to go back to his uh, early history for some of the motivations. It was clear that uh, having been brought up so strictly by a missionary family that considered his grandfather, the first Hiram Bingham, to have been a great man, he wanted to be a great man, too. And there is another reason. In 1900, Bingham marries Alfreda Mitchell, heiress to the Tiffany fortune. Overnight, he joins the American aristocracy. As he once told me, he didn't want to be known simply as the man who married her.
Confederate soldier, Francisco Pizarro, the Spanish Catholic Empire collided with Peru's magnificent Empire of the Sun. The conquest was short and brutal. In 1533, Pizarro and his men descended on the golden streets of Cusco. Within two years, the city had been ransacked, stripped of gold, melted down to ingots to satisfy their greed. Three years later, the Incan king struck back. Thousands of Incans descended on the city. Hand-to-hand -hand combat raged in the streets. Fires were set to burn the conquistadors from hiding. Hopelessly outnumbered, the remaining few dozen conquistadors withdrew to a key fortress and shut themselves in. Eleven months passed. Eventually, the Incan forces dispersed, returning to their fields. The Spanish held out. Reinforcements arrived. The Incan king had lost. Exile meant building a new capital in the forsaken jungle, where the conquistadors couldn't penetrate. But where? In the ancient volumes of the libraries, Bingham reads the few accounts of their retreat. Within the chronicles of a few religious men and Spanish soldiers are found the only sketchy clues to the lost city. Details of architecture, estimated days of travel. He copies the words for his reference in the field. From these, he will take his best guess and begin his jungle search. Bingham's final preparations for the journey take him to the outlying valley of the Urubamba to acquire mules to carry loads and gear. Peru has changed greatly in 400 years, yet the ancient culture is still reflected in daily lives of the Peruvian people. In their language, Quechua, which the Inca imposed on the conquered people to unify the empire. In their customs and traditions, weaving and textiles, which were traded as a form of currency. And the pure-blooded faces of the people themselves. Even in 1911, no day is begun, no voyage undertaken, no harvest complete without the permission of the gods. In his search, Bingham follows a consistent pattern. He seeks out locals, anyone with information, even rumors, then follows up and pays for any good advice. Ironically, his best clue comes not from a book, but a drunken government official named Quevedo. He mentions a name Bingham has never read in any chronicle. Machu Picchu. Strange words that just a few days later will lead an ambitious young American to a great temple in the clouds. By July 19th, Bingham is ready to head out. He will leave Cusco and head north along river valleys with only sketchy maps and fragmented descriptions from the Spanish chronicles to guide him. But he cannot succeed alone. A military escort is assigned by the local prefect, a Sergeant Carrasco, who is charged with accompanying him everywhere and to serve as a translator of the Quechua language. Also with him will be fellow Yale man Dr. Harry Foote, the expedition's naturalist and collector of insects and specimens from this little-known part of the world. Bingham writes to his wife, My dearly beloved, nearly all the last things have been done. It remains to pack my trunk, which stays here, get some sleep, pack my duffel, and then start for the interior. The valley of the Urubamba is enchantingly beautiful, still terraced in the Incan style. This is one of the loveliest valleys in Peru. It was a favorite resort of the Incas. I do want you to see this. It is worth it at all costs. The mountains are indescribably grand when one can see 10,000 feet of them. 
as he wrote in the letter that I found in the papers to his father at the time of his starting on his first expedition, that he uh, felt the blood of his ancestors stirring in his veins, and that he felt was part of his genetic inheritance to want to travel and explore. There is a new government road which Bingham follows into a region visited only by local Indians since Incan times. Somewhere, lost behind these ranges, are Incan cities that fit the descriptions in the ancient library chronicles. The chronicles say the city will be called Vitkos, not Machu Picchu. It will have a palace with an extensive view, marble doorways, a great rock shrine, and a mention of another name, Vilcabamba. What Bingham cannot know is that there is more than one lost city, and it will be his destiny to find them. <laughs> On July 24th, Bingham and his team are camped near the spot where the drunken Cavedo has told them of ruins. What happens next is a story Bingham will tell and retell of the rest of his life. On the sixth day out from Cuzco, we arrived at a little plantation called Mandor Pampa. The owner, Arteaga, had said that on top of the magnificent precipices nearby, there were some ruins at a place called Machu Picchu. I offered to pay him well if he would show me the ruins. He demurred and said it was too much of a climb for such a wet day. But when he found that we were willing to pay him a sol, three or four times the ordinary daily wage in this vicinity, he finally agreed to guide us. Bueno, tal vez el tiempo cambia. Shortly after noon, just as we were completely exhausted, we reached a little grass-covered hut 2,000 feet above the river, where several good-natured Indians, pleasantly surprised at our unexpected arrival, welcomed us with dripping gourds full of cool, delicious water. Then they set before us a few cooked sweet potatoes. <laughs> Arteaga had been there once before. Baby, you can 
of architecture and the natural environment. A city that shouldn't exist. It's curious that he only spent a few hours at the site. He noted in his diary the time of his arrival and the time that he'd taken these photographs and what they represented. But it wasn't more than uh, uh, three or four hours that he spent uh, wandering around with this camera. Bingham has come to find the lost Incan capital as described in the chronicles. But without a great rock shrine, Machu Picchu doesn't fit the description. A great view alone is not enough. So, at precisely 5.05 p.m., he leaves. This isn't what he came for. It wasn't until uh, later that he realized how important uh, a discovery he had made. On July 25th, 1911, Hiram Bingham, looking for the lost Incan city, moves deeper into the uncharted valley of the Urubamba. Confused and puzzled by the spectacular ruins he has just discovered at Machu Picchu. August begins with a week of fruitless searching. August 3rd, 1911. My dearly beloved, at last we are at Santa Ana, staying at the fine sugar estate of Senor Pedro Duque. Now, Bingham is starting to convince himself that maybe Machu Picchu was what he was looking for. Yesterday, after a long conference with Senor Duque, I came to the conclusion that my new ruins, the fine ones at Machu Picchu, must be those referred to in the chronicles by the name of Vitkos. Local Indians tell Bingham of extensive ruins deep in a valley called Vilcabamba. August 7th, 1911. My dearly beloved, this locality is reputed hereabouts 
They have a lot of ruins. Just as I hoped it would. No one has been up here. I have shown several of my Peruvian friends the pictures of my family. They always admire them all tremendously. While Bingham seeks clues to ruins, Harry Foote is making another sort of collection. Foote is an amateur naturalist, but a talented one. He is finding quite a few formerly unknown specimens. The villagers of Lukma tell Bingham of nearby ruins with a great granite shrine, just as the chronicles predict. With an Indian guide and the local lieutenant governor, he heads for the site. I found myself on a pleasant open plaza, bounded on its north side by the ruins of a large palace. The view from the plaza is a particularly extensive one on all sides. To the north and south are snow-capped mountains, and to the east and west, deep, beautiful valleys. A palace on a hill with an extensive view. So far, so good. And at the center of the ruin, a building more than 200 feet long and 43 feet wide, a masterpiece of Incan architecture. The treasure is gone, but the craftsmanship endures. Doorways of solid granite, six to eight feet thick, quarried, shaped, and moved up the slopes by hand. Enough remains of this building to give a good idea of its former grandeur. It was indeed a residence fit for a royal Inca, an exile from Cusco. Is this Vicos? There is only one way to be sure. Find the great rock shrine. We arrived at this place at four o'clock and were at once impressed by the truth of what we had heard and convinced that this was indeed the sacred spot. The rock was so much overgrown and surrounded with jungle, especially on two sides, that we made arrangements with the lieutenant governor to have a force of Indians come here on the morrow and clear the rock so we could take photographs and make measurements of it. Okay, señores. Por favor, arriba. Arriba. Bingham is convinced. This is the holy shrine of Vitkos. To the Spanish, a nest of pagan demons. But for the Incans, this was a sacred shrine, abode of the gods, bursting with power. A place to make sacrifices, to ask for help with crops, to foretell the future, to beg for protection. The rock is final proof that Bingham has found Vitkos, the ancient capital. But is it the last Incan city? There is the second name mentioned in the chronicles, Vilcabamba. There could be another palace still hidden. Bingham carries on, reliving the final chapters of the Incan Empire. The Spanish had crushed almost all resistance, torturing, raping, forcing thousands into the mines. Only one holdout remained, the Incan king in his jungle court. In 1572, the Spanish ruler in Peru decreed the Incan king must die. They found he had escaped from Vicos, but the Spanish resolve was fierce, and Bingham is just as determined. An Indian gives Bingham information. 
There are some ruins, sometimes called Vilcabamba the Old, a few days away through dense, steep jungle. This is a ruin. This is a place that has been...
Back in America, Hiram Bingham finds his discoveries eclipsed by Amundsen's reaching the South Pole. With the South Pole conquered, the age of exploration is declared complete. But Bingham's return thrills his family. Elfrida and their six sons are deeply proud of their explorer and his exotic discoveries. Elfrida is also relieved she has found running the household alone exhausting. But Bingham can't stay. His instincts tell him the ruins still have more secrets to reveal. He spends months trying to raise money for another mission. And in February 1912, a lucky break, the editor of National Geographic magazine attends one of his slideshows. The editor is impressed. He offers to send Bingham back to Peru to clear the ruins and photograph them for publication. For Hiram Bingham, celebrity is just an expedition away. <laughs> By July 1912, Bingham is back in Peru. He seeks to solve the riddle of Machu Picchu. Who built it and why? My dearly beloved, we are all very well, but are having bad luck with our search for buried bones and pots. This is a lovely spot. It is most disappointing not being able to find anything worthwhile. Who lived here? A city this important should have gold, bronze, perhaps even mummies. We finally offered a prize of one sol to any workman who could report the whereabouts of a cave containing a skull and who would leave the cave exactly as he found it. The gambit succeeds. At last, Machu Picchu is beginning to give up its secrets. My joy knew no bounds, and I was able to lay hands for the first time at Machu Picchu on a perfect piece of Incan pottery. <laughs> Bingham immerses himself in the Incan realm. Water jugs and drinking ladles, reflections of ancient fetishes and dreams. A lucky hunchback, a puma, a croaking frog, charms and implements left with the dead for use in the next world. A world so close, Incan saw ghosts often, and mysteries that the deeply spiritual Incans sensed all around them. Three months of clearing reveal a wonder. Beneath nature's green shroud, Bingham discovers the remains of an entire city. Bingham is amazed by what he sees. In these houses, husbands, wives, and their children once lived beneath thatched roofs. And staircases, 3,000 steps, winding their way through the city like snakes. Over 100 terraces carved into the mountainside, fields of potatoes and maize. Stonework, so perfectly joined
broken window into the Incan spiritual world. Architecture of sublime perfection. Stonework so precise only one person would have been worth the effort. An Incan king. Bingham christens this compound the King's Group, a palace for the Son of Gods, surrounded by a legion of priests and servants who attended his royal majesty. A king dressed in cloaks of the finest fabrics, some even made of bat skin. But there was one place where even the king was humbled. The Inti Huatana, compass, observatory, and shrine, one of the few in all Peru not smashed by the conquering Catholic Spaniards. A great stone that measured the course of the heavens, sun, moon, stars, each a god in whose power rested the fertility of the land and the lives of mortal men. With no written language, the Incans left only the legacy of their stones, and Hiram Bingham has found the only Incan city left untouched by the conquistadors, a perfect window on the past. Just now, when we thought there was practically no portion of the Earth's surface still unknown, one member of the Daredevil Explorer's craft has struck it rich. The lucky man is Professor Hiram Bingham of Yale. He has just announced that he has had the superb good fortune to discover an entire city. He calls it Machu Picchu. In 1913, Bingham's photos of the Incan city fill an entire issue of National Geographic magazine. The images amaze and enthrall a public fascinated by tales of exploration. Overnight, Machu Picchu becomes a legend. In the decades to come, this mysterious city becomes a magnet for thousands of visitors. Tourists, scholars, and film crews flock to the ruin, seeking to understand its riddles and get a glimpse into a lost Incan past. Rested undisturbed until the expedition of Dr. Hiram Bingham cleared away... For Hiram Bingham, the city gives him what he always wanted, fame, and entry into the inner circle of the world's greatest explorers. His fame reached its peak at a dinner that he was asked to be present at when Peary, the discoverer of the North Pole, and Amundsen, the discoverer of the South Pole, met before the cameras at a uh, big dinner at the headquarters of the National Geographic Society. That uh, certainly gave him a sense of uh, his importance as an explorer. Building on his fame as an explorer, Bingham enters politics. By 1925, he leaves his post as governor of Connecticut to serve in Washington as a senator. Bingham adores the status and attention. He becomes one of the country's most visible politicians, never forgetting his love of adventure or the power of pictures to promote himself and his causes. But Bingham's luck runs out in 1929, the year when all of America hits hard times. Bingham's enthusiasm for quick success finally leads him astray. He hires a lobbyist and becomes embroiled in a conflict of interest scandal. Bingham has earned many enemies. Fellow senators resent his money, his aristocratic manner, and his habit of correcting their Latin. The Senate seizes on his mistake. Bingham is formally censured by his peers, a humiliating blow. Bingham loses the next election in 1932, the same year that Alfreda, his long-suffering wife, leaves him. Bingham's meteoric rise has finally come to an end. But through it all, Bingham never forgets about Machu Picchu. Over the years, he retells the story of his greatest discovery over and over again. In 1912, thanks to the support of the National Geographic Society and of Yale University, we were able to go back and spend four months in clearing the ruins of the mighty jungle that had accumulated there over 300 years. 
And in 1948, the man and the city come together one last time. Bingham is invited to dedicate the highway that will lead tourists up to Machu Picchu. Ironically, Bingham pays little attention to the other cities he found in 1911, both last refuges of the Incan king. Neither city excites the public the way Machu Picchu does. Uh, while he had a distinguished career in other fields, uh, his name is remembered primarily as the discoverer of Machu Picchu. And he uh, naturally wanted it to appear as important as possible. To the end of his life, Bingham inflates the importance of Machu Picchu. He declares it to be both the birthplace of the Incan Empire and its final refuge. Bingham dies in 1956, never learning the answer to the greatest puzzle of all. Who built this lost city and why? Today, Machu Picchu's origins are finally understood. It was not the citadel of the first Incan king or the last. It was the private sanctuary of the greatest king of all. Pachacuti. In the 1400s, he conquered all of Peru for Cusco. He ordered the construction of the greatest fortresses in the empire armies of workers cutting and hauling thousands of stones in a country without the help of the wheel, horses, or even oxen. All done for Pachacuti. But in the winters, he came to Machu Picchu, his personal retreat, a place to rest and entertain leaders of the empire. But Bingham found no trace of the king no gold or silver. Instead, the pots and bones in the caves belong to the king's servants, the men and women who built the city. Pachacuti died in 1470, his body returned to Cusco. But Machu Picchu remained his, even in death. Only his servants were allowed to stay, living out the rest of their days in obscurity. Ironically, the city that was once home to the greatest Inca of all was in time forgotten, even by the Incans themselves. While war raged below with the Spanish, the city on the mountaintop remained untouched, unknown. It remained unchanged until 1911, when one man, dreaming of glory, stumbled upon this Incan wonder. A place where time seems to stand still, as though the Incans never left. Five hundred years ago, the mountains were gods, the thunder their voice, the sun their ruler, and the Incans their people. In the 1400s, this great renaissance produced magnificent monuments, golden art created, an empire flourished. Halfway around the world, at exactly the same time, another empire was growing, Spain. Cities of just 50,000 people, a poor country with great ambitions and little tolerance for those who did not worship their God. Their churches strained to reach the sky, leaving the world and nature far behind. Inside, believers were given glimpses of God and the afterlife to come. In 1532, this empire of God collided with the Incan Empire in Peru. Appalled by sacrifice, but amazed by gold, the Spanish took over, leaving ruins in their wake. But one Incan temple survived the conquest. A sacred city built to be near the gods, Rocks carved to join with nature, not to transcend. It. 